When I an awesome wonder Consider all the worlds thy hands have made I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder Thy power throughout the universe displayed Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee How great thou art, how great thou art Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee How great thou art Hostage-taking and kidnappings have become international concerns over the last few decades. People are taken, they're snatched, and in some cases, they're held for ransom. Terrorists often kidnap their political and religious enemies and offer to release them if their demands are met. Last summer, we first saw video footage of tunnels constructed by Hamas a Palestinian Islamic terrorist organization. Hamas built these tunnels over a period of several years so that the tunnel would begin in Gaza, the Palestinian city-state, if you like, and then burrowing those tunnels under the border with Israel, quite a ways under the uh, border, so that the opening of the tunnel would then be in Israel. Hamas intended to infiltrate Israel underground, and then once in Israeli territory, carry out murderous terrorist raids, as well as kidnapping Israeli soldiers and citizens, taking them back through those tunnels to Gaza, holding them as hostages in an attempt to win more concessions in its ongoing war with Israel. Hostage-taking and kidnapping is not only something that happens for political or religious reasons. People are kidnapped so that they can be enslaved and used as virtual property. Sometimes they're brainwashed so that they'll come to embrace the beliefs of their captors. An entire syndrome is called the Stockholm syndrome when that happens, when a person is kidnapped, held for so long, and perhaps brainwashed in such a way that they actually begin to identify with their captors more than they do their past, with their family, with their country that they were taken from. And sadly, victims do identify with their captors and sometimes see them as saviors and protectors. Sometimes those who engage in human trafficking only want money from their victims, so they use and abuse them. And sexual trafficking has seen an alarming increase in our world. Last year, the United Nations reported that human trafficking is second only to illegal drugs in the profits realized by hostage takers, kidnappers, criminals, pimps, thugs, and terrorists. Hello, everyone. Welcome to you, wherever you are around this world. I'm Greg Albrecht, and this is the audio teaching ministry of CWR Christianity Without the Religion. CWR is all Jesus, all the time. CWR is faith alone, grace alone, and Christ alone. Today, our message is titled, You Are Unsnatchable. And it's based on a passage in the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John. Before we read from John chapter 10, verses 22 through 30, join me in prayer. Dear God, today we pause to consider what many within religion, Christendom, and beyond consider to be a preposterous promise given by Jesus. This promise seems to say that we are promised your security, your protection, and your love, no matter what. Guide our discussion today so that what we see 
and what we receive is centered in and on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. John, the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 22 through 30, is our keynote passage. Beginning in verse 22, then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were there gathered around him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. We're going to focus in our message today titled, You Are Unsnatchable, On verse 28 in this passage, where Jesus says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. A few months ago, the third film in the Taken series was released. All of the Taken films have starred the Northern Irish actor Liam Neeson. And the basic plot, at least particularly in the first two films, is that Neeson is a former CIA operative who tracks down and rescues members of his family who are taken. In the Taken films, Liam Neeson follows the predictable, all-too-common human answer to violence. He fights fire with fire. In order to rescue his loved ones, he has to be more brutal and more animalistic than the barbarians who have taken his loved ones. For example, in the first Taken, in the Taken series, this first one released in 2008, Liam Neeson's character is named Brian. Brian receives a phone call from the human traffickers who have taken, snatched, kidnapped his daughter, demanding money for her release. He tells them on the phone, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want. If you're looking for ransom, I can tell you I don't have any money. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills, skills I have acquired over a very long career. Skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. If you let my daughter go, that'll be the end of it. I will not look for you. I will not pursue you. But if you don't, I will look for you. I will find you, and I will kill you. Of course, I'm not recounting that to exemplify the life that Christ lives in you and me. Violence is not the answer. Violence is an unending cycle where actions beget reactions, and the reactions escalate so that there's no end of bloodshed and mayhem. It doesn't matter who did what first. It just continues and continues because someone else did something, and then we respond in kind. And it's often been said, as you've probably heard, that an eye for an eye, which is essentially the principle that we're working from when we give a retribution in kind for something that we have suffered. An eye for an eye leaves both parties blind. Violence is not the way of life advocated, taught, and lived by Jesus. Violence is not the way Jesus rescues us. Violence is completely opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus rescues us in a 
counterintuitive, that it means counter in the way that we would imagine and think, in the way that we would take care of something. It's counterintuitive, the rescue of Jesus. It's upside down from the way we would do something. Jesus rescues us by receiving and accepting all human hatred and violence on his cross. Now, a few verses before our keynote passage, when we're talking about how that we, by God's grace, are unsnatchable, a few verses before our keynote passage, as we find Jesus walking in Jerusalem at the Festival of Dedication, and he speaks about his sheep know his voice and follow him, and that he gives them eternal life and they'll never perish, and that no one will snatch them out of his hand. A few verses before that, in this 10th chapter, still within the chapter, we see Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd. We'll find that in John chapter 10, verse 11. In fact, the first part, I mean, first almost 20 verses or so of John chapter 10 is devoted to this teaching of Jesus telling people that he is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. And he explains in this early part of the 10th chapter of John that he laid down his life for the sheep willingly. No one, said Jesus, took his life away from him. He gave it willingly. He allowed it to happen. For that matter, he says, he had the power, because he was God in the flesh, to take his life back again, which, of course, he did in his resurrection. People say, well, God resurrected Jesus. Well, yes, he did. But Jesus also resurrected Jesus. Well, how can that be? Because God and Jesus are one. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one God. Jesus rescues us, not by living by the sword, but by letting the anger and hostility of the sword and of violence and of the the whole way of life that humanity has always lived from the very beginning when Cain killed his brother Abel with a sword. He takes that and lets that way of life, that hostility and hatred, which leads to vengeance, which leads to, of course, violence and murder and mayhem, he lets it burn itself out in him. That's one of the ways we understand the cross of Christ. His cross, his willingness to lay down his life is the singular symbol of his willingness to accept and receive all human hatred and violence. Think of a huge bonfire where all human hatred, all human grievances toward each other, towards anyone, including towards God, is just piled into this giant bonfire of hate and murder and mayhem, and Jesus consumes it all. He sucks it up, if you like. That's the way he rescues us. He doesn't meet fire with fire by starting other fires. He takes our fire and consumes it. He doesn't return evil for evil, but he takes evil and he returns good. In our passage here in the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus assures us we are safe with him and in him. This passage is an absolute ironclad guarantee from Jesus that no one can spiritually snatch you away from him. Reiterating John 10, verse 28, Jesus says, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. No one. The guarantee is not If someone somehow is able to kidnap us and hold us hostage for a short while and Satan is able to deceive us or whatever power or force might snatch us away, then God will pay the ransom. No, God doesn't pay a ransom for his children because he doesn't need to. He doesn't let them be kidnapped 
are taken in the first place. You might say, well, some people and some passages even in the Bible speak about Jesus paying a ransom, that he was a ransom for our sin. Well, yeah, that's a a metaphor, if you like, and a statement of what Jesus did, but that was on the cross. That's not after the fact that we're given God's grace and we receive God's grace. From that point on, we are unsnatchable. Now, the larger context of our keynote passage, as I said, includes Jesus' well-known teaching that begins this 10th chapter of the Gospel of John, saying that he is our good shepherd and that we are his sheep. So when Jesus says, I will give them eternal life and they will never perish, no one will snatch them out of my hand. He does so following on the heels of what he had to say about the good shepherd rescuing his sheep. Some will say that Jesus is saying that no one else can remove us from his hand, but we can snatch ourselves away. We can remove ourselves. But such an idea militates against the significance and meaning of what Jesus had to say about the good shepherd and his sheep. Of course, by their very nature, by the nature of the metaphor Jesus used, we have to include the fact that as sheep, we wander away. That's the point. Since we, as his sheep, always wander and wander away, Jesus says that he, as the good shepherd, will always bring us back and keep us from spiritual danger, so that there will not be some event where we're snatched, taken, taken hostage, and as we've seen horrifically, even beheaded by misguided, hate-filled religious terrorists. Jesus says, I will give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Now, he's not speaking about something physically that may happen to us, that we may get mugged, we may be in some horrible accident, that someone may uh, take money away from us, that we may be, if we are serving in the armed forces, uh, the victim of some untoward event. No, he doesn't say that. He doesn't promise that something physical, something even horrific physically will not happen to us. No, this is speaking spiritually. We will never perish spiritually. No one will spiritually be able to snatch us out of the hand of Jesus. If you're one of his sheep, you are unsnatchable. The emphasis of this passage is that Jesus is capable. He has the ability. He has the power to keep his sheep in his hand, in his flock. He is saying that he's given his sheep eternal life. They're never going to perish. And again, he's speaking of spiritual life, not physical life. If you take a look at the entire keynote passage again that we read, it begins in verse 22. And in this verse, we read of the festival of dedication that had just taken place in Jerusalem. It was in the winter. The festival of the dedication was a Jewish observance that celebrated the liberation of Jerusalem and of its temple from the Syrian king Antiochus. The problem with the celebration was that in the vast majority of cases, the entire focus of the Jews at that time was on the temple, which they regarded as a holy building where God lived, and that's the only place that he really was on earth, and on a piece of real estate that they believed to be the holy city of Jerusalem. The festival of the dedication then involved, when you think about it, a potent mixture of religious fervor and nationalistic emotions. And it wasn't the first time in history when we see that happening. That is an explosive mixture. So that the religion of the Jews and their national identity was the focus of this observance. It was a lot of jingoism, a lot of nationalism, a lot of drum beating going on. There was little room for Jesus and the gospel, the one true God incarnate in this or indeed of any of their celebrations. If you think that's a strong statement or maybe a little overstated, 
Consider that Jesus, God in the flesh, was walking among them, but they did not recognize him or accept him. They rejected the experience of God in the flesh. In the second chapter of this Gospel of John, if you go back and take a look at that, we won't, for lack of time, they rejected Jesus when he changed water into wine, which was more than a miracle simply ensuring that everyone at that particular wedding celebration would have enough wine to drink. The first miracle of Jesus was a clear message that Jesus had come to replace the water of the Old Covenant with the wine of the New Covenant. The religious Jews then, along with their religious authorities and their professionals, found it far easier to consecrate worship and focus on exterior buildings and tangible pieces of real estate than to accept the all-encompassing new life in Christ, which Jesus preached as his gospel a gospel, and a message that will transform us not only externally, but internally, because Jesus transforms us from the inside out. And that is still the problem with Christless religion within and without Christendom today. It, Christless religion, is, as Jesus said in Matthew 23, only good enough to whitewash the outside of a tomb, but on the inside of that tomb— There are dead men and women's bodies. It looks good on the outside, but when you dig into it, you find a lot of pollution, a lot of corruption, a lot of death. That's a metaphor for Christless religion. And so when we read in verses 23 to 24, Jesus was walking in the temple, and these religiously pious and devout people said, well, are you the Messiah or aren't you? Tell us plainly. This was really more like an accusation. Their skepticism of Jesus caused them to essentially say, give it up. You're a fraud. You're an imposter. You're not Messiah. Put up or shut up. Do something dramatic. And Jesus said, of course, you don't believe I'm Messiah. You're not one of my sheep. I'm not your good shepherd. My sheep know my voice. You don't. They know my voice and follow me. Now, how did the religious professionals respond to everything Jesus said to them on this occasion? We didn't read it. It's at the next verse following our keynote passage. Our keynote passage ended in John 10, verse 30. Here's verse 31. Again, after hearing these words, his Jewish opponents, and let's, again, it would be any religious, non-Christ-like religious opponents, picked up stones to stone him. They, like many Christless religious people today, are incensed and angered by the thought that Jesus expressed dogmatically in John chapter 10, verse 28, I give them, that is my sheep, eternal life, and they, my sheep, will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. You are unsnatchable. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, our Heavenly Father, thank you for sealing us so that we are unsnatchable. Thank you for assuring us of our eternal spiritual refuge in you, that our house is with you, and that we will dwell with you forever and ever, while we endure physical problems in this life. And even then, Jesus walks alongside us. But our spiritual reality is that we are unsnatchable, and you will keep us safe forever and ever. With our thanks, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's our sermon for today, and we want to tell you, first of all, about our sermon next week. Our sermon will be titled, From Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 through 30, Married to Jesus. Married to Jesus. Join us then. Thank you so very much for allowing us to be a part of your life. Tell a friend about this ministry. We love to have as many as possible, the more the merrier, that we can proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, faith alone, grace alone, and Christ alone. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times 
and in every way, the Lord be with all of you. Please join us on our website, www.ptm.org, for more spiritual nourishment that we provide through the many ministries and resources here at Plain Truth Ministries.